pretty brother came over from the old country and settled in Goochland, Virginia. And they finally migrated down into North Carolina and Tennessee. And uh, back then, everybody was woodworkers or metal workers or whatever. You, you either made what you needed or traded, bartered with someone that did that. You couldn't run down to the furniture store and buy your furniture. You couldn't go to the hardware and, and uh, buy your tools. Someone had to produce them. So uh, we had all these people coming from the old country that had all the uh, knowledge to do these things. Blacksmith, tinsmith, uh, woodworkers, uh, farmers, and all that. Well, anyway, uh, one of the Woody brothers settled on Cane Creek out of Bakersfield, and uh, they, out of necessity, they built their chairs and tables, and they built their wagons, and there's a long process to go through. Um, I worked for off and on for about six years with my grandfather. My dad died when I was 15, and that's another story. It's in the book, and uh, I had a determination to, uh, to make chairs, and uh, I learned from my grandfather. And uh, I smoked a pipe then, and he smoked his Prince Albert about once an hour while we'd sit down and, and uh, have a smoke. And I was full of questions. And I figured out in my mind, if, if I'm going to know this, I'm going to have to find it out from the old people, the, the how and the way to go about this. So. Uh, uh, I learned a, I learned a lot from my grandfather, and I've learned a lot from other people through the years, uh, older people that has helped me along the way, and in turn, I like to do that for the young people now because this is the most difficult time this nation has ever known. My dad was crippled. He and Granddad took about Dad took ten years, and Granddad took twenty away from chair making to work for a big railroad, the CCNO Railroad. And uh, my mother's people were Arringtons from Haywood County, and my grandfather Arrington was a very fine woodworker, had a water wheel and a grist mill and all that. In 1916, two hurricanes came to an apex over North Carolina, and a terrible flood came and washed out along with a lot of other things, washed out his mill race and his tools and everything. There's 13 children in the family. They put their, there's farmers too, they put their chickens and hogs in wagons and came from way down uh, Fines Creek, Jonathan's Creek, down in that area, out to Clyde, and they put that all in wagons. And they tied their cows behind the wagons and uh, they put it all in a box car at Clyde, and the Clinchfield cotton mills in Marion was just coming into production. So they uh, drove their animals, the train stopped and they unloaded everything. They drove their animals up into the cotton mill village and a big house was already arranged for them. And Grandpa went to work doing carpenter work, building cabinets and all that kind of thing. And all the children that was 12 years old or older could work in the cotton mill. And the oldest boy was the least one, and he didn't weigh enough to work. They had a limit to, and uh, the hiring personnel told him to go back and put his shoes on, his barefoot, and eat him a good breakfast, or eat him a good meal. And they all worked one year approximately a year, saved their money to buy granddad a big hit and miss engine. And uh, they all went back to Haywood. And during that time, my grandfather and my dad's camp cars were railroad camp cars were camped at Marion. And those old railroad boys would go up into the cotton mill village of Corton. So that's how my dad and mother met. And uh, when they went back to the mountains, the uh, 
Arrington family. Uh, Dad stayed in touch with Mom, and uh, she came back and got a job in the mill, and she boarded with some uh, father's people. They married, and uh, their job took them, after several years, to Forest City, and Dad was a fine carpenter, a very accomplished carpenter. And he had built a toolbox when he was about 16 or 17 year old, working on the railroad. And uh, so uh, he built the family a nice home, mom and dad and two sisters, and had nearly a new Model T forward, and money in the bank. Well, dad was lifting a push car on the track one day and dislocated the hip and they didn't know what to do that day and time. So they put him in traction, and gradually his hip got worse. And then he, there wasn't any compensation from the railroad in that day and time. All the doctor and hospital bills had to be paid. And in a year, that was all gone. And Dad hopelessly crippled. He was in a brace. And uh, finally, through the years, he graduated to crutches and his last year's a walking stick. But he's only 27, 28 year old when that injury came. They left Forest City with a mule and a wagon and my sisters in it. They came to the west side of Marion, moved in an old farmhouse and uh, started farming. Mom had eight brothers and a couple of them would come at a time they had the mule, their neighbor had the mule. They teamed up together and plowed and planted. Dad got chickens and they had pigs and a cow. And uh, with this produce, uh, well finally mom got a job. The depression hit and I got born, so we was hit with a triple whammy right there. I mean, we lived meager. But when crops came in, they were able to take uh, wagon loads of milk and butter and eggs and produce into uh, a back lot next to the courthouse in Marion and sell and trade for what they needed at home. Well, it took a long time. There's a long distance went in there where we were just from one house to another, from one place to another, and we moved near the cotton mill uh, where mom could stay at home. And uh, so uh, I was born in 29 then, and uh, Dad not been able to do anything, hardly more than with his hands. He could, he could do small things with his uh, shop tools. And there's a picture of a chair in this here that he made for my baby sister out of hickory, and he hewed it out with a hand axe. He didn't have a bandsaw, didn't have sandpaper. And uh, you can take broken glass and scrape wood with it. It don't last long, you have to break it again. But he made ax handles and hammer handles and he sowed plants, he sowed tomatoes and cucumbers and pepper and all that. We, we survived, but with great effort. So from about three, three years old, I was, I was having the milk, I learned to milk and uh, feed the pigs and, and uh, do the work around the house because I was the only boy. Well, uh, uh, finally, uh, I got interested in Dad's tools at about four year old, and I'd get into his toolbox. If I could catch him a little ways away from home, and him being crippled, I'd get in his toolbox and I'd hammer and nail and I was, I was antiquing his toolbox. If we get over to the other shop, I'll show it to you. I was, I'd drive nails in boards and they'd go all the way through. Well, he put a lock on it. And I found out I could go to the back of the toolbox and knock the pins out of the hinges and lift it up this way. <laughs> And he found me doing that, so he put a long rod through there. I can show it to you, and stapled it down. But anyway, uh, the year I was 15 years old, 
I called a train in Johnson City, Tennessee, and worked in a hardwood flooring plant. They didn't ask how old you were, it was wartime. And uh, I done a, there's some details there that I won't go into that are very interesting, it'd take too long. I came back home and went back to school that fall, and Dad died that winter, I was 15 when he died. And I'd cleaned out dairy barns for this man here, and uh, uh, he'd take me home in the evenings. After Dad died then, uh, I went down to a neighbor's house, and he had a horse and some bottom land. And I trained that horse to plow, and I plowed and planted corn for school was out to feed my animals. And when school was out, uh, I got a job on Mount Mitchell. They was building a road from the parkway up to the peak. And uh, I'd get up in the mornings and milk and feed my animals and eat. And I'd walk two miles and catch a truck at 20 minutes after six. And if you wasn't there, the truck wouldn't wait. And I never missed a day, only they let me off a couple of days at a couple of different times to plow my corn out. So the next year, I went back to school and was able to finish. When I finished school, I got a job in the furniture factory. And I hired a ride to and from work. I, I wanted to save my money. I didn't buy a car. And it wouldn't mean girls date you if you didn't have a car. So uh, I liked a little bit of work in three years. I was making 65 cents an hour and I saved $850. And one morning I, I quit the factory and a day or so later I caught a bus to Charlotte to this place that supposedly had used machinery. And when I, I walked a long way from the bus station and when I got there it was boarded up. And uh, there's a hardware next door and the man that had owned it was the manager of the hardware so uh, I picked out the tools I needed, some of them were used, and uh, I paid them $736 for the tools. And he said, okay, where's your truck? I said, you'll have to ship them to me, I'm riding the bus. <laughs> so uh, uh brought them home and went to work in the basement of our house. And, uh, but I still didn't have a car. And my granddad stopped one day and, well, the day I was uncrating them. And he said, what in the hell you got here? <laughs> I told him, I said, I want to make chairs. So on Sunday afternoon, I thumbed a ride from where I lived eight miles out to where his shop was. And uh, the first day we worked, uh, he, he showed me what to do. And I watched him and I listened. And the first day we worked, we assembled six chair frames, not as much as anybody had. I could use a bandsaw and I learned how to sand and I learned how to cut out the different things. And I learned the, the backs, we boil and curve them. I'll show you this. Some sitting here somewhere. Mm -hmm. Your boards won't always bend in the middle, so you have to seek out the center of the bend. And as you go up in the chair, each back gets an eighth of an inch longer, so you have to make one, two, three, four, five, or however many backs. So uh, the next day he hired me. And it wasn't too long till he made me his partner. Wasn't too long till Joe Cheek reared up his ugly head over in China, over in Korea, and I went to Korea for summer and the winter, and it was tough. When I got home, I went back to work with Granddad, and in my spare time, I built my shop building over where my showroom is. And uh, in 1955, I moved in it, and Granddad retired, but I found out that I've been making chairs longer than any other Woody by the name. 
Our schools consolidated here in about 1971, and uh, they didn't have anyone to teach shop. They moved the shop teacher up to the principal. And uh, last three months of school, I went uh, over there and taught shop. And that's a long story. Uh, I've got letters from those students. The, the former shop teacher was the brother of the superintendent. And uh, it, the shop was almost a joke. The boys just had not learned much. Well, I went over before the Easter holidays and I told them, I said, man, I said, I'm gonna be working with you. I didn't tell them I was gonna be their teacher. I said, I'm gonna be working with you after Easter. And I said, I want you to bring something to build, something to repair, uh, something to work on. If you don't, I'll let you help someone that does have something. But anyway, I had a good time. It was real fulfilling to be able to work with them. But I told them, I said, besides this test paper, I want a separate paper with what this course has or has not meant to you these last three months and uh, I kept those things. And if I ever have a blue day, I get them out and read it. But those boys still, still remember me. A lot of times they come by. And uh, if you do something for a child, they won't ever forget it. You do something to one and they won't do it. A lot of people, when they come in and look at a chair like this one, uh, it's about 775 in Walnut or Cherry. It's hard to see that much money in it. By the time you boil and bend those back, you got to barter for your lumber, trade for your lumber, you got to boil and bend the backs, and dry them. Your post has a moisture differential between the backs and the rungs. And by the time you get all that done and finished it, you paid for your power and your sandpaper, and investment in what you got in your tools is just a reasonable good wage is all. Out here is where it all starts.